to remind everyone that there's a uh, charge conference tonight after the service, or well, after the service, and everyone is welcome. Uh, there's a trunk or treat tonight, uh, Wednesday night at six o'clock, and uh, there's a produce drop off Thursday at two o'clock, and we need volunteers for that. Uh, there is a prayer guides for the election at the Welcome Center for anyone who needs it. And I would like to remind everyone that there's offering plates in the back for anyone who would like to give. And uh, I'd like to invite everyone to stand up and for worship. Amen, would you stand with us as we sing? Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much that you meet us here. And so God, we pray that we wouldn't miss that. Um, that God would push everything else aside that might um, weigh us down, that might compete for our attention. Uh, God, so we can focus on you and who you are, so that, um, as we talked about last week, God, so we can bring you our best, uh, because, God, we know we get your best every minute of every day. So, God, lead us and guide us in our time of worship here together. Amen. Build your kingdom here.
before we play this next song, I just want to give you an honest, um, an honest confession, uh, if you will, and um, that is uh, that is that is this that this next song we're going to play is is unashamedly one of my favorite songs uh, that there is out there, and I'm not afraid to tell you that just because you know when you pick up songs sometimes you end up with your favorites, and I think it's my favorite because um, in in crazy. Um, hectic, anxious times, um, this is a reminder that brings me back to base. Um, so this morning, maybe that's what this song does for you as well. I 
It's always into your name. Amen. Amen. Get you out of Kids Central or so you may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to our worship. It's great to see all of you here this morning. Scripture this morning is from the book of Acts. And I'll be reading a portion of chapter 2, beginning in verse 37. The context of this passage is that Peter has just preached his sermon at Pentecost. Now listen. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for God, for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, every one whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. All came up on every one because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is God's word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, calm our bodies and excite our spirits. Focus us now on what you have to say to us, not through words, but beyond words. So we pray today for people in need, people grieving, people struggling with decisions to be made in their lives in the future. And we pray for the church and all who make up the body of Christ. Give us hope and give us guidance. We pray in the name of Jesus who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The birth of the church takes place at what we call Pentecost. We celebrate it every year in the life of the church. It was a moment in the life and the history after Jesus had been ascended into heaven that the Holy Spirit came upon those who were followers of Jesus, the apostles and others. And it was an exciting moment, a time that is hard to interpret and understand because the Holy Spirit was there and there were dancing tongues of fire, all kinds of things taking place. Many languages were being spoken and yet they understood each other in their own language. And then Peter stood up and preached. He started talking about his heritage and the heritage of all the people in the Jewish faith and talking about David and then talking about Jesus and how David had talked about Jesus coming and Messiah coming and all of those things happening. And, and they experienced a wonderful movement in the body, the people who were there. And when Peter stopped preaching, they asked, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus. 
met about 3,000 people. Now think about 3,000 people. 3,000 people were added to that small group of followers of Jesus. 3,000 people. That's a pretty good crowd, isn't it? In anybody's language. And it's a pretty good response to an invitation to follow Jesus at any time, anywhere, any day. 3,000 people. The interesting thing is that we continue to read and we find that the people there were held in goodwill by all of the people, all of the people around them, the community. They continue to go to the temple and pray and have services there. And according to this passage in Luke, and in, in, in written by Luke in Acts, there, there was a, a, a wonderful experience taking place as the apostles led the people, and their response was that they listened to the apostles' teaching. They joined in fellowship, the Greek word is koinonia, which carries a little more with it than just a fellowship meal. They shared things in common. They remembered the Lord's sacraments, and they prayed. They prayed. But we turn the pages just a few chapters later and we find that Peter and John were going to the temple to pray and something happened. A man there who had been ill for quite some time asked for some a, a coin. He was placed there not to be healed but to receive money as a contribution. And Peter and John, Peter said to them, we don't have any money, but we'll give you what we have in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. And this man who had not walked began to get muscles in his legs and began to hobble and walk and picked up his bed and walked away. And then we find something else happening. In the fifth chapter of Acts, things turn sour. It's really amazing what happens sometimes when things are going well. They sometimes turn sour. And there we are introduced to Sapphira and Ananias. They were part of the group. So they decided to sell their properties and bring the proceeds in, but they had a little secret going between themselves, and that is they were not bringing the whole load. All the proceeds they did not bring. They kept some back for themselves, a rainy day or a selfish day. And when they did, somehow Peter knew it. And Peter confronted him first, and he spoke, and he was struck dead. And about three hours later, after he had been carried out and buried, his wife came in, and she said she gave her testimony, and she was struck dead, and she was carried out and buried. I've been to the Holy Land. I forgot to ask where their graves were. I wish I had seen them. Oh, what a moment. And all of a sudden, the things that were going so well, fellowship, teaching, sacraments, prayers, and it turned selfish and sour. But the church continued to grow. And the book of Acts is the book of the Acts of the Apostles and the followers of Jesus. And it isn't long until we come upon Paul and others who begin to spread the word everywhere. gospel began to move in spite of people being selfish. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting how we view churches? I grew up in a small rural church, very small rural church. I was just interested in going. On the farm when you work six days, it was time to have a day off, and church was the day off, and we, we, we walked to church, had a good time. But I remember when I was probably about nine or 10 years old, I was out front of the church, the worship service was over, and some men were standing on the steps, and they were collecting money for some particular reason. 
And one of the men who pulled out a $20 bill, now think about a $20 bill a long time ago, that was pretty heavy money. And he pulled out a $20 bill and he said, before I give this to you, I want somebody to go to Mr. Arthur so he can see me giving this. And all of a sudden I realized that the man who had been standing before us many times and doing all the things that he did, that he was viewed as the church. This was Mr. Arthur's church. And now in reflection, I can see it. I can see it. I, I, I've been in a church where the church was Miss Ann's church. She made all the decisions. If you wanted to do something in the church, you went to Miss Ann first. And she would not only give you permission if she gave it, she would tell you how to do it. It was Miss Ann's church. It's interesting how we see churches and how we experience churches. The church is of God. The church is of God. And it is God's gift to all of us. Amen. To all of us. Judah Weller, who was the lead teaching pastor at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. for some time, wrote a wonderful parable. It's about a seacoast that was very rocky and many ships were wrecked on that seacoast and many lives were lost as a result, as a result of those rocky and dangerous shores. But some people in the community decided they wanted to do something about that and they got a few little boats together and they worked out a schedule so that someone was out there all the time, 24 hours, seven days a week, every day under all kinds of conditions so that when a ship was wrecked, they would try to find the survivors and save their lives. They were known for their commitment. They were known for their bravery. They were wonderful people, and a few people would join them occasionally. But there was a kind of an experience in which many people joined and got involved. But they decided the boats were too small, so they upgraded their boats. They decided that the little hut they were meeting in was not sufficient and they built a larger building. And in the process of all of that, they changed their name, their name from being a life-saving community to being a life-saving society. They would initiate new people into the group, never taking them out on an excursion to save lives, but standing before a picture of a large boat, and they would be inducted into the fellowship and they would never go out. So they started hiring people to be the rescuers with new and upgrading boats. And the people of the society re remained inside, enjoying their fellowship and each other and talking about all of their experiences and how brave other people had been. And there continued to be shipwrecks and most of the people were lost. Now I want you to hold that. Hold that a minute. Some months ago, something happened to me in the middle of the night, I had a dream. And I got up after the dream and I went to my desk and wrote it down. I did not want it to slip out. I thought it was really worth preaching for sure, but maybe it was a word from God. I told Sally the dream the next day, and she said to me, isn't there somewhere in the Bible where it says, old men will dream dreams? <laughs> and I have to admit there is. You may have been in that dream because I do not remember all of the faces. Some of the faces were new to me. You may have been there. Some faces were familiar. We were gathered in a little group, we all had backpacks, and we started walking to a little village not far from where we were. We were going there to see people and visit with people and to bless people. When we got there, they were, they were there. 
Some were lying on the side of the street, some were standing. They were all welcoming us and saying, can you help me? I'm hungry, can you give me food? I'm crippled, can you bring healing to me? Will you pray for me in my addiction? Will you, will you help me? Will you bring healing? Will you help our town? Will you help our community? And all day, all of us, all of us were blessing people. We were sharing the scriptures with people. We were praying for people all day. It was our intention, our, our intention to leave there in the afternoon and go to the next village, which meant we had to cross over a large mountain. But the people in that village said, stay with us. Spend the night. You can go tomorrow. And we placed blankets upon those. And they glowed with the words peace, love, hope. We rested well overnight and got up the next morning prepared for our journey across the mountain to the next village. And someone called our attention to the mountain. And they said, look, and there we looked up the mountain. Big boxed car letters. Welcome, church. Welcome, church. Hold that over against the society to rescue people. It's not easy to be the church today. It's really not easy. And I look back, I look back at the ministry and the history of the church, and I see dramatic changes that take place. You know that 500 years ago, in the 1500s, Martin Luther took his stand and led a reformation and we are the inheritors of that cosmic reformation. And about 500 years before that, and in, in about a thousand, there was a vision in the church that went east and then it went west. And we're part of the west. 